welcome, welcome everybody to the summertime edition of law.mit.edu's task force on the responsible use of generative AI for law. Um, thank you for being contributors to the task force's report, which is um, currently in draft form. And um, if you were a contributor, you were invited to this forum. Um, and, uh, and what we hope to do today is uh, to have a relatively informal discussion, a little bit of an update of where the task force is at, but also we want to hear from you and provide something a little more human than, uh, than a Google form as a way for you all to e express your, your views and, um, and for us to perhaps have some discussion. Um, just for the sake of um, sanity and um, good order, um, people are sort of on mute right now. Uh, but if, th if there's something that you would like to say, you can pipe up. I think the easiest way is you can put your hand up, but also pipe up in the chat with what you'd like to contribute, you know, with questions, comments, ideas, and then um, and then task force members um, and Damien um, can um, can um, kind of unmute you. So with that, um, let me say I'm Daza Greenwood of law.mit.edu, and uh, I am delighted to uh, to say that we have um, gone through what I would consider a very legit process in this MIT task force to explore the topic of responsible use of generative AI for law. Um, we started with the members um, of the task force coming up with our own best guess of what might be in such principles. Um, and that got us to version 0 0.1. Um, and then we um, had a larger concentric circle of um, quite a few people who we um, re requested feedback from. Um, many of you I see in this very Zoom. Um, and then at that point, we felt comfortable enough having battle tested it a bit with a wider circle to do a, a very early, I would say, release of a draft, which is 0 0.2 at, that you would see right now and that um, we'll go over shortly on uh, law.mit.edu forward slash AI. And um, for that release, um, it being published publicly, we invited public feedback and review. Um, through an open Google feedback form, and that has turned out to be a really good thing to do. Um, so there's been a wide variety of perspectives and vantage points and ex great examples uh, that we've received. In addition, um, we have also um, jointly with Stanford's Codex, um, thank you to Megan, um, a, held a in-person feedback session as part of one of Codex's um, generative AI um, events um, uh, two or three -ish months ago, um, and that was um, incredibly um, useful. It's part of the reason why we're having a, a Zoom today is because there's something when you get people to talk that is just um, um, magic that you can't get through a Google form. Um, then we did a second one, thanks to, where is he, Robert Mahari of MIT um, as part of an event that uh, he led at MIT where we similarly um, um, had a, a kind of live feedback session, and that was invaluable as well. I should thank Olga Mack, who can't be with us today, for um, co-facilitating the in-person session with me at Stanford, and and um, Aileen and Olga, and Aileen is with us, another task force member, for co-facilitating the session at MIT. Um, and uh, and we've also done some presentations to bar associations and got good feedback and a real interest in taking this work forward as part of their own future rulemaking. Um, the one I'm familiar with is the California Bar Association, uh, where they've also kindly made me an um, advisory member of their, I'm going to ruin the name, but the, the committee that deals with um, professional rules of, of um, responsibility, um, and also with the American Bar Association, um, where I spoke on this and other topics at their annual meeting, I think last week, and, uh, and they have kindly made me an advisory member of their presidential task force on generative artificial intelligence, and that will be the vector for us to share these ideas um, from this whole community and also our draft into the ABA as part of their rulemaking. But it doesn't stop there. Um, uh, Damien has also told us, uh, Damien Real, who is with us and who's been a terrific contributor, um, that, that he's also done terrific work kind of um, funneling these ideas into the Minnesota State Bar Association, and the thumbs up indicates that it's been 
they've been receptive to these ideas and no doubt receptive to, to the messenger as well. Um, and so uh, with that, um, I just want to say thanks again for, for joining us today. And I'd like to hand it over to Megan Ma, um, who will we'll do a quick walkthrough of where we're at right now and also has a really cool announcement to make about um, about the um, about how we're dividing and multiplying um, the um, the environment within which the task force operates. So with that, um, Megan, um, it's all yours. Yeah, thanks so much, Daza, for the introduction and for setting the stage here. I feel really kind of proud of our task force that we've kind of gone through these iterations and are able to arrive even at version 0 0.2 to be able to publicly share. And I just wanted to say that um, since we've announced kind of this public um, feedback and kind of requesting sort of, you know, what your insights might be, we've gotten close to 50 responses. And that goes to show just how significant um, this era of generative AI is becoming for the legal space, not only the legal implications from a professional responsibility standpoint, but also how you the use cases and sort of how to integrate them into our legal workflows. So it's incredible to see so many faces here, even for um, our kind of public forum today, but also the comments that we received. Um, I also want to give a shout to Stephanie, who I see uh, on camera. She was the one who sort of really kind of put our task force in the work that we're doing and kind of trying to get more eyeballs on it. I think the more the merrier. And so kind of that's a good segue for me to say that the task force went from being M the MIT task force to now a joint task force with the Stanford Center for Legal Informatics, so Codex, where I work. Um, so we're really thrilled about that. So in going forward, a number of our workshops that we host on generative AI and law will include kind of questions related to professional responsibility and what really is the evolving role of the lawyer. Um, is it in the training of our lawyers? Is it in the training of our students? All of those issues will come to head kind of as a specific part of our coming events. So we're really thrilled about that. So this is all thanks to the enthusiasm of all the faces here. Of course, to Stephanie, who kind of helped put this forward for us, and also to the task force members who really love doing this just on their free time. And so we very much appreciate it. So now to the meat of the content. So for those of you who haven't actually already seen the um, principles or um, have seen a version of it but didn't kind of look at the where it's housed I'll just quickly kind of run through that again so as Daza mentioned it's on law.mit.edu forward slash AI um, and the latest version still is of June so we're hoping that the outcomes of not only kind of the information we've already received through our Google um, form that will also kind of put together some of the comments and thoughts from today's forum uh, as part of kind of version 0.3. And we want that to be kind of the most comprehensive to date. Um, as Daza mentioned, we started off actually basically with just the seven core principles out there. So as a reminder, these are the seven principles, um, duty of confidentiality, duty of fiduciary care, duty of client notice and consent. And you'll see an asterisk there because that very much is an open question even amongst our task force. Um, duty of competence, duty of fiduciary loyalty, duty of regulatory compliance and duty of accountability and supervision. Um, these are sort of the version 0.1. And then kind of version 0 0.2, what we try to do is better enumerate or qualify what we mean by each principle, providing what we saw as an example that is consistent with the principle and an example that is inconsistent. Um, and kind of from behind the scenes, this took a very long time, even across our task force. We were very careful um, that even the examples that we give, we don't create kind of categories or sweeping categories by what we mean by that. We want it to be pretty sensitive to how these technologies will continue to evolve and just wanted to find kind of ways in which, you know, a broad sort of example, um, but not quite kind of um, tethered to this current state of the technology. Um, one thing that we continue to debate about was the client notice and consent. I think mo many of the sort of task force members were divided in the idea of, you know, what are the limits of consent here? 
knowing that, you know, this technology is bound to be integrated deeply into our workflows. Um, I think regardless of whether our decision to use legally specific AI, um, I think that's one point, but all of our existing Office tools, such as Office 365 or Google Workspace, they're going to have some form of generative AI directly integrated into them. So one way or another, we're going to be exposed. So the question is, in terms of consent, is, you know, what exactly are we disclosing here? Um, and is it just the content specifically, if it's generative content, such as, you know, I used it to draft part of the contract, or I used it to draft, you know, um, certain other documents or other, you know, use cases. So I think this is where kind of a lot of our open questions are, and that we would love to get your input on. Um, and I think the other open sort of question around uh, what we see with version 0 0.3 is, should we get more granular in terms of what exactly we see as viable use cases for these tools? I think in coming out or coming out of still the fascination of the tool and large language models itself, um, I think it's still a little bit of spaghetti in the wall, to be honest, in how people are using um, these tools. There's, of course, kind of techniques around prompt engineering, but what is the role of legal prompt engineering, which I know Daza and Olga have been really kind of pushing forward. Um, what will be kind of the future of the engagement models with these tools? Is it kind of, if it's integrated directly with, say, Office 365, is it just a button that we're faced with and that we need to understand and peel back the curtain almost? So if there's a button that says professionalize and, you know, you have a couple of bullets and you click that button and it basically transforms your, you know, couple of bullet points into a comprehensive contract through a button, um, what does that necessarily mean? So those are some of the questions that we want to tease out, I think, going forward. Um, and I guess the last point that I often think about is, obviously, this came out, um, and this is especially important in light of the Mata versus Avianca Airlines case, which I'm sure many of you already know. And I think for this, it exposed, you know, um, this imbalance between trust of the tool perhaps some um, over-reliance on the tool um, against kind of what we see as the future of professional responsibility. And I know that many of us here um, recognize that that was somewhat reckless behavior uh, on all fronts in terms of how it was used. Um, and so obviously many of you are here today because you know that that's not the way that you will be using um, these generative AI tools. So I think I will pause here, as I've said a lot, um, and I want to open the floor uh, in particular to a few questions that we had actually asked as we solicited responses for feedback on the task force. I will kind of leave them up here. Um, uh, in particular, we're asking, of course, like, are there other duties that we think need to be included? Um, is there any input, particularly jurisdiction specific? So we actually didn't, We it's largely tethered to the US. Um, in particular, some of you have commented that it's not too far off from the ABA, um, but it's an extension in some cases, but what happens when it interacts with something like the EU AI Act or other kinds of regulation that we need to be aware of? Um, yeah, so I will pause here then. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. Um, that was um, stellar tour de force, as as always, Megan. Um, and may I just ask before we dive? Oh, so this is a prompt, as it were, for for everybody that's joined today. Um, if you have questions or if you have ideas or comments that you'd like to share, one thing is I well, I invite you to do it. I think the simplest way is to put something in the chat so we kind of have a an idea of what you want to say, and then we could we'll take you off mute. Um, just please be aware that um, that this is being recorded and what we'd like to do in a, I think very much an MIT tradition for these types of task forces is operate pretty much in the open. Um, and so what I'd like to do is um, take the recording of this forum and, and put it on the task force website. So if you prefer not to, ha to ha not have your likeness or voice 
on a on a video um like that then don't don't come off don't do that and just go ahead and use the form or you all have our emails um i made sure that all the task force members were on the um on the email so you can hit reply and we could take it out of channel uh, but for this forum if if you'll indulge me please i want to kind of keep in the the open transparent um kind of legal hacker tradition of mit and um but don't let that slow you down from sharing your views in other channels. But if you have views that you don't mind everybody hearing, come on off mute and let us know. And to give you a little time to let that percolate, um, I would like to ask um, if uh, uh, Shauna, uh, my erstwhile co-chair, um, Aileen, um, Damien, or or any others in the, uh, or actually Stephanie, come you're an honorary um, member in my view, uh, based on especially your, your stellar contributions at Stanford and, and the great article you wrote. If any of you have anything that you want to say just to to frame things before we get into it, now is a great time. And also we'll give people half a second to um to see if they can bubble up a contribution. Well, and thank you, Daza and uh, Megan, for uh, really taking the leadership on today. So we definitely appreciate it as many of us have been on vacation. So thank you all for being here. As we dive into AI, I mean, AI has been around for decades, and um, I ran the Watson Legal Practice for about a decade, and it's really fascinating to see the um, really maturity that AI has taken even over the past year. And one of the things that I did want to mention, would love to hear um, thoughts about, is even in 2015, Watson alone, so Watson is an AI program that IBM had, had over 1 billion users, and a majority of those did not know that they were using it. So I think some of the challenge that we have here is many people will not know they're even using AI because it's just part of their day to day. So what is it that we can put together, um, put in place in regards to our principles, but then also education and knowledge that we can take to the marketplace to make sure that people don't become complacent and just start to rely only on the technology, really leaving the human behind. Um, some of the best projects that I worked on with IBM Watson at the time, and even now today with generative AI, is those where they don't take the one and done response. Instead, it's a build out a kind of an exploration of how to use that generative AI and keep on getting better and better and better. So I wanted to mention that uh, having been you know, um, focused for a decade, that was one of the uh, issues that I, that I saw. And I'd love to hear from everyone their thoughts on that, because I think we will get to the, to a very near and dear future that we won't know what we're using, honestly. You're here. This is Damien. I have uh, something to add to uh, Shauna's really good comments that uh, that largely if AI is doing its work, it's invisible. Uh, that is, we don't know we're using it. And also the definition of AI changes over time. Uh, if you'd ask someone in 1990, show them Google Maps, and that would have been amazing AI until it's not AI. It's just software. So um, this uh, it's, that's a prelude to largely my comment to whether client consent is necessary. Um, do I need to get client consent or to notify my client that I have checked over the first year associate's work? Uh, do I need to get client consent to say that I use spell check? Do I need to get client's consent to be able to say I use Grammarly or another grammar checker? Um, those were AI, right, until they're not. Um, and so really I think we need to think about as, as we go forward that AI is not this point in time, but it will become just software as we go forward. So we don't want to make rules that will seem silly in five years. Okay. Anybody else uh, from the task force have any any things to say? No, there's no pressure, but if so, now, now's a good time before we dive into the mosh pit of open conversation. I'll just throw out a quick note of gratitude also to you, um, to you and Megan for putting this together and, and Stephanie as well. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to hear what people have to say. We already have people chiming here uh, in on the chat. So yeah, nothing beyond that. And as I'm trying yes. to unmute, I know Stephanie, oh, go ahead. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, yes, I'm in an airport, so I'm very loud. So I will say mostly on mute. Um, uh, just thank you for including me in this. I, the reason I wrote about this is because I think it's very important. I mean, I've been writing a lot about AI and generative AI in the last six months. And I'm also familiar, like Shauna said, that AI is nothing new, but this really has taken on a new 
life of its own. And I do definitely agree with the point that a lot of people don't necessarily understand that they're using AI, even when they are, you know, I see you hear a lot of people say, I would never use AI, same way I would hear people say, I would never be in the cloud and like they are. So I'm just really curious to see how this plays out. And it's just really interesting for me to hear what the industry is thinking, what they think the issues are. So with that, I know it's very loud where I am. So I will mute myself and listen to you all. <laughs> and thank you again so much for, for publishing that thoughtful piece and for all that you do. It's about half of how I know what's going on with legal tech. Um, okay, so I see that there's a, why don't we get started with the, the forum part of the forum uh, and uh, Cassie Burns, I saw that you had a, a contribution or you've got the floor. Well, thank you, Deza. I appreciate it. Um, I am live largely in the e-discovery world, and I'm sure you all know that we've been using AI and machine learning for a while via TAR and things like that in litigation and in an adversarial way. Um, so, you know, something that we're doing within the EDRM group, which has built out an e-discovery reference model and built out information governance models and things like that. There are conversations about working groups around AI, you know, whether it's AI ethics or AI bias. And we had a call last week. And something we talked about is, you know, providing guidance to people on, you know, the potential of AI bias and in, in, in writing a white paper. And so uh, the recommendation that we kind of talked about was, well, maybe we can continue the spirit of EDRN and build out similar types of models where, you know, you're talking about maybe general use cases, you know, for us, we're, you know, we want to stay within the role of e-discovery since it is EDRN. So, you know, there's a different concern with, with AI bias in civil litigation of big corporations fighting each other and using AI there versus, you know, maybe criminal investigation or criminal matter and, and um, AI being used on data that could potentially be, you know, bias could be applied and, and wrong, you know, uh, access to such social justice issues. So, you know, our thought was building out, um, and this is very early stage, it's kind of like a model that is, you know, takes into those elements of what, how are you using the generative AI or the AI? What kind of AI are you using? Um, what where did that data come from you know is it very kind of droll business data corporate data versus you know is it is it data surrounding an internal investigation and how people communicate and and you know in the vernacular of text messages and in what sort of um sentiment analysis are you doing and, and potential bias associated with that so and then building out you know potential you know, areas of risk associated with those different levers. So um, we have some applied scientists from Reveal and, and Relativity working with us on, on that. So, so it may like feed in well to that. Of course, our focus is very much on electronic discovery, but I'm sure, you know, we like any law firm and any lawyer out there has legal, we have legal op uses of generative AI. And I think it, it may be a nice collaboration. So, um, here, here. Um, it, was that Aaron, by, by the way, uh, from Relativity? Was he perchance the applied? He wasn't on that, but I'm hoping he will be. I do know Aaron. He and I are fairly friendly. So, um, yep. Um, awesome. And J John Tredernick also comes to mind as a... Yeah, Jerry Boo is on it. There, there was a smaller group again. We're in very, very early stages, but the thought is to do a white paper. You know, I think having a white paper, but being able to like pop out some high level, you know, models to use. And again, I think if you know, education to people, I think is very important. I'm also a member of the Academy of Court Appointed Neutrals, and there are you know people who've been you know court appointed master or special masters that have been partners for a long time, and they're very afraid. <laughs> Of generative AI and don't even want to talk about it. Like whenever I raised it as this could be something we could do for the judiciary is, you know, offer training, just awareness, like knowing the difference between AI and gen AI. I know Doug Austin shared a really great article about the issue with this, you know, the standing orders and, and using AI generally, as you mentioned earlier. Um, and I think that there's a lot of education, but there was even fear of this other member of the organization of like, I don't even want us to train or talk to, you know, the judiciary about it because there's such a fear of it commoditizing the legal profession. There's, there's, you know, I think just having practical discussions about what, what they are, how they can be used. And 
it's not going to be great for everything. And you know what? You actually have to work at it. You, it's not going to be perfect. The first iteration out, it is an iterative process. So I think having those real conversations with people is very important. Again, those of us in e-discovery, we know it. We would never use an active learning project and use the responsiveness rates or, or rankings in the first iteration and be fine with it and, and assert to the judge and the opposing party, this is great. We, we just uh, you know got rankings once and we, we didn't train anymore. We would never do that. So I think it comes to you know use cases, defensible processes and what you're doing to validate, you know whether it's the underlying data or the outputs. So very process driven. Yeah, so awesome. have, um, have they mentioned any other fears besides just more of the jobs being taken over? I mean, I think in e-discovery, it's definitely client data and things like that. But I mean, the quote to me was literally, you know, I don't want my career to be commoditized. I, you know, the fear is clients and business people will see I can just use AI to, to do this legal work and legal work will go away. I mean, I, I personally don't think that. And I, I think you saw similar things whenever TAR started being integrated in e-discovery, like in 2008, you know, late aughts, early 2010s. There's a similar thing. The issue is you need people who understand the technology. That That's really, I think, the important takeaway. So the more you learn how to use the tool, the more value you can bring to your client. There's still going to be very... Um, complex issues that you have to deal with that AI is not going to be able to manage. You know, at yeah. the end of the day, it's a tool that should be making our lives easier and taking some of the rote work away, maybe first draft of things. Um, I mean, that that's, I think, you know, some of the fear right there. And, I, and I also, and I also think that there's like a lot of overhype about AI. I think a lot of people talking about it just kind of like in the world online they talk about how great and easy it is to use, but they're really not talking about how much they have to work with it to get the end product that they need. So that's not helping things either. Can I just comment on what Cassie says about fear is, so I'm a plaintiff's attorney and I've also done a public defender for 11 years. Um, I can't emphasize enough this fear element that's preventing attorneys from using all of these tools and all of these language models. I've spoken about this topic uh, to many lawyers, and it blew my mind how many attorneys had not even tried using the language model because they were just afraid to try it. Mm -hmm. And they would later privately email me and say, can you send me the website for this? And I'm like, oh my gosh. Um, I think it's, I'm, as respectful as I can say, it's insane how many attorneys are not even trying and have no idea what we're even talking about. And I think that in terms of, you know, this task force, like attorneys having a responsibility to learn this. It is such a cop out to say, I don't understand it. Um, I think there's even some kind of malpractice arguments you could make on the criminal side, specifically, you know, on the criminal side where you've got machine learning being used to develop risk assessment tools for bail, facial recognition, unless attorneys realize that you can challenge these predictive models and how wrong they can be, it's 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 malpractice. And uh, on the plaintiff side too, plaintiffs, I do civil, um, like I said, I use it almost every day for either, you know, preparing for depositions, for openings, for closings. You've you know, so many tools that we have at our disposal, and we have such a responsibility as attorneys to, to both educate attorneys on this topic, and like people need to jump on board. It is just, uh, like I said, I've spoken to so many yeah. attorneys who explained how this works, and it's like, right. If I could, Debbie, just a uh, hi, I'm um, MJ Wilson Billick. I'm a privacy cyber AI lawyer at an international law firm, Evershed Sutherland. So, uh, one of our big concerns, because I mean, I've seen demonstrations of Gen AI, but I think the concerns we have, and they're very substantive concerns, is around uh, confidentiality of the data when we enter it. And, and we've uh, looked at a number of systems and um, really, I think, not just confidentiality, but preserving privilege. And uh, I believe one of our comments, the first comment we made on uh, to, to the principles uh, was that some of these systems that we're seeing 
um, we'll have uh, we'll have the, the the producer or the the producer of the system uh, maintaining the data for 10, 15, 30 days uh, while they use it. I think not to train the data, not to train the model rather, but to um, optimize their system and to check whether the the, respo the responses that are given uh, are correct. And so we're concerned that that kind of a process uh, will be uh, impacting on a privilege for us. And so we are looking for a platform where we would have more control over that. And we wouldn't be having, say, lawyers behind the scenes that are hired by the platform provider, uh, not having that, uh, those people uh, having access to the, to the prompts and the, and the data that we're entering into the system. And I don't know if anyone else has that issue that they've been concerned about, uh, but the issue of, of um, privilege is one that we would like to see the, the principles um, kind of address, maybe as part of the confidentiality issue. Um, but uh, because uh, I think we, we do disservice to our clients, you know, if we allow uh, data to be entered into the, into the system that's confidential, uh, and that we want to keep privilege, but we lose it for some reason uh, down the road because uh, we haven't been careful about the systems we're using. And, and just to say, we also have, right now, we're in a process where we're saying you can use this uh, chat GPT or other Gen AI systems, but subject to our three rules, you know, that you can't, you can't enter client data, can't enter personal data, uh, you know, and you have to check your outputs. So, um, you know, th those are pretty standard, uh, I think, terms of use at this point. Um, so that's one of the things I wanted to raise. I don't know if anyone has any thoughts about uh, using uh, the, the challenges of maintaining privilege in the way the current systems are structured. Uh, and we are starting to see that platforms addressing this just because they've, I think, maybe a, a number of other um, firms are raising this issue uh, with the platforms. I can at least say that um, P, uh, I'm aware just through our feedback form that you're not the only person to raise that as a question. So I, I'm aware it's an active question. I think it re deserves and requires further analysis. And I believe you also pointed out the terms and conditions is one place we can look to begin to complete the facts necessary to do an analysis to start to ask what are the implications for privilege. But I think that's uh, it is early days. Um, I'm unaware of this well, happen, happened in uh, like I don't think it's metastasized to a, to an actual challenge uh, yet where people have um, you know uh, basically claimed privilege and had that challenged. Um, and so therefore, this is a perfect time to begin to look at what would be the safeguards and protections needed to be able to maintain privilege in the face of a challenge when generative AI has been used. And I think. Um, Hey gang, like let's put that on our to-do list for version zero three, shall we? Because it's like uh, it, there's been popular demand. Mary, before you go um, off mute, you would also post something. I don't want to pressure you, but you'd post something interesting in the chat as well. I was wondering if you'd like to address it related to principle three and third-party rights. Uh, I, you want, uh, I'm happy to. I raised that. Yes, so we have. We had some question about. What was meant, I think, in that principle is I have S6 in my version. I don't know if it's the name. Uh, oh, where it talks uh, about the six. My, my bad. Sorry. It's okay. The duty of regulatory compliance and respect for the rights of third parties applicable to the use of AI applications in your jurisdiction. And we just weren't quite sure what was meant by respect for the rights of third parties in that context. Yeah. yeah so, it goes to us. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this is, I mean, I would love to hear other members of the task force speak on this as well, yeah. if you use, but my view on this is I've always regarded six as like the junk drawer in the kitchen or something. <laughs> uh, like we crammed a lot in six in terms of like, uh, so the, there, there were various like drafts where sometimes we split out privacy and intellectual property questions. And, and we, we sort at this point, we've collapsed the accordion to, you know, uh, regulatory compliance and, you know, like with whatever applicable law, it, regulatory and legal compliance. And then, you know, some of, I think, were the nod to that so that it wasn't lost in the, in the um, 
contraction to just one brief principle was there are IP rights um, that can that are we already have like any number of litigation uh, examples of people um, testing uh, what their continued IP rates are. There are questions. I don't know that it's got to litigation yet, but about personally identifiable information that can come out. And then adjacent to that, there's um, questions of, you know, in this in the style of or or maybe rights of celebrity or persona that come out in different ways. And so anyway, there that was some of what was animating that. But I, I feel like this is somewhat still un um sculpted territory in six. Um and mm -hmm. so to the extent third party rights exist that need to be taken care of as part of the responsible use, that's our placeholder now. And I think we need to surface those, examine them, and think about what is the best guidance. And that's still very much a work in progress. Okay. Can I just answer uh, Mary's yeah. question? There are companies such as Opaque Systems that are addressing this issue for security so that you can use LLMs at your company with your information staying confidential. So, you know, I don't see companies who are using these large language models haven't certainly done this yet, um, but we certainly are working. There are companies that are working for it, like Opaque yeah. Systems, which want you to be able to have these secure rooms for your data and utilize all of these large language models. Yeah, that's what we're, we've come to, the, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, one, one of the ways that we were possibly interpreting the idea of rights was one that we were mentioning earlier is one of bias that ensuring that in fact, what we're, uh, how we use the tools is not going to encourage bias and how, how understanding how the tool the tool is trained. Just wanted to add that in there. One of the ways we were thinking that might might might, might be what it was meant. Well, if it wasn't, it might be next because uh, that's a very <laughs> very funny <laughs> point. <laughs> uh, any anything else from any of the uh, task force members before we move on to the next? Okay. Uh, in that case, let's try this a new way. Oh, I'm go on. Excuse me. Oh, I was just going to say, sort of building on Debbie, and I think also Sam's point is that um, right now, because sort of OpenAI was a front runner here, and whether you use say Anthropic's Claude model, I think that's an argument behind open source models, and the fact that say Llama two is becoming incredibly powerful and actually pretty comparable to the competence of GPT four, for example, or even or more similar to Claude two. I'd say that um, that kind of mitigates some of that, I guess, fear or uncertainty certainty around the potential leakage of client data just because you'll be building a custom LLM within your own like instance and so there is definitely more exploration in that space um, I see Sam Harden had something on the privilege question so before we move to another topic Sam did you want to contribute that uh I don't have to discuss it, but I was just saying, you know, I think we're going to see a lot of vendors in legal technology saying they have an AI product and not disclose what model they're using, where they're sending the data, just saying that they're using generative AI in some way. And I, I think that, you know, this isn't a, a question for the task force, really, but I think we should think about, you know, are they, do they need to be obligated to say, you know, we're using, you know, OpenAI's API or Claude's API or another API, and we're sending your data elsewhere, or, you know, we're processing it in-house for you and keeping it separate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, thank you for contributing that. that. That really does get back to almost like a third rail uh, that we, we've, we've somewhat stepped on uh, that Megan identified as part of the framing of this session, and it relates to um, the question, I would call it, of consent um, and notice um, and just how that plays out. And we've got, I think, the widest variety of views. On more, uh, There's no principle that has got a wider variety of views um, than that one. Some on one side believe it's critical to actually get consent, and it almost has a feeling like with um, First Amendment or FOIA, like, you know, the best disinfectant is transparency and, and actually outright explicit specific consent um, with this stuff to deal with some of the unknown ramifications and possible you know second order consequences of using this. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, we've heard very loud and clear, probably numerically more 
folks have said, um, you know, we use all kinds of tools. Um, that's part of what we do is, as you know, train professionals, we don't, you know, get into detail on that and, and we shouldn't and we won't. Um, and then there's a lot of gradations and different axes between those two points. And I, that one of the things I was hoping that we might hear different people's views on, not necessarily your positions or anything or nothing binding, but just different ways to look at that and any thoughts on where that might most beneficially come out at the end, because we do want these guidelines to be as good as possible. We want to get them out you know, sooner rather than later. Um, and we want to say something that's beneficial on that point. Um, I see a hand. And I see Damien's hand, and that means hopefully we'll hear words from Damien's mouth. Uh, words from Damien's mouth, indeed. So, uh, so really, I've, I've thought a lot. Of, Sam is very smart, obviously, and I, I really uh, th think highly of what he said. Thinking as somebody who's building these tools, um, I would think, okay, if I'm using, say, an internal model that I've, I've built within my systems, and I'm taking user input and using the model internally, um, that's probably less concerning to the end user because I'm not, not not actually pushing it up to GPT-4 or something else like that. So, really, I wonder if the the objection that Sam is having is with which third parties are you providing my data? So it's not necessarily which model you're using, uh, but it's with whom are you sharing the data? Uh, maybe that's a, a clarification on that point. Damon, you said it better than I could have said it. Thank you. From Damien's mouth and his brain. Um, okay. It, 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 is there, if, it, I, if, if I could, I just to say, I, I think a notice is very helpful. I mean, you know, one of the one of the voluntary commitments of the uh, you know the AI companies made at the White House was that they would work on. Uh, uh, watermarking or, you know, some kind of evidence of that this was an AI generated uh, output because there is such concern around deep fakes and uh, all that. So I actually think it could be helpful to have notice. Yeah, uh, Mary Jane, one of the things I wanted to mention, I'm so glad you brought this up. So at IBM, uh, they created a special font that was specific huh? to anything with IBM Watson. So anything that wasn't actual human created would have this font. So maybe that's something um, I've been on quite a few of those white house meetings too. And I kept on thinking, I'm like, I need to write a letter in just to mention that because maybe it is a font or something like that. I mean, we think about, you know, it's similarly to CRISPR Cas9, if you've worked in that in the medical field, where when they create something that's synthetic that goes into our body, there's a light feature that happens. So it is kind of like, almost like, um, uh, kind of like enlightens the things that aren't that aren't native to the body itself. So uh, a font would probably even work also. Ex I mean, except for the bad actors, they could probably get into it. But that's an idea that would be an interesting watermark. I have one comment on that, and, and I've seen like I know the the content authenticity authenticity initiative. I think it, it's part of Adobe. I can't. I always get the the a wrong, but there I know working, I think on some sort of, you know, embedded watermark or metadata, but I think something that's worth considering, you know, that's a potential good option, but a lot of times the work product we have isn't only human creator or only generative AI created. It may be an initial draft that then get, gets worked on a lot by human. I mean, so I think some really great use cases of generative AI are hey, we have a client that we've worked with over and over and over again. They have their specific style of RFP responses. We're going to, instead of manually <laughs> going and pulling from our case files and manually copying, pasting, editing, we're going to build a bespoke model for this and have it do first edit. And really, it's like the first edit job, you know, and they're not going to do final copy or anything like that. But so the first version is going to be heavily edited, massaged, finalized by humans. So at what point, you know, is it, it's AI created, but human heavily touched it all the way to get it out the door. So I think that's something, again, Gen AI tends to be binary discussions, but it's really very like hybrid mix intertwined. So, you know, accounting for that in these discussions, I think is important. That was actually my point as well, that, that uh, there's fully human created, fully machine created, but almost everything will be in between. Uh, and so will I say that these three words are generated by a machine? Maybe, but that seems silly. Uh, thing number two is to the point of fonts, that works well enough, but um, uh, if I paste uh, as plain text into a Word document, of course, those fonts go away. So uh, all, all that's to say is that these are important problems. Uh, the solutions are really hard. And now it is my incredible 
um, pleasure to it, invite Liz to speak. And this will be the first time I've actually heard your voice, although I feel like we're old friends already, thanks to LinkedIn and all, everything else. So Liz, um, I see you have a contribution. You have the floor. Oh my goodness, um, I wasn't expecting that. I was just contributing to the chat. Hey, everybody. Um, I work, um, just by way of background, I work in legal education. So in particular, practical legal training, as well as I consult to firms on uh, tech, but from a human-centered design perspective. Um, so I guess some of the um, and comments, and I, I guess my, like I've on LinkedIn, I've been promoting a lot of content about prompting and generative AI really to help lawyers get comfortable with, um, I, I think, this new tool because I, I, I'm experiencing or when I speak to people in person, I, I see a lot of fear, a lot of resistance and a lot of, um, I, I look at them, I, the way I experience is that when they talk to me, it's just completely like, that's a low quality thing to do. I would never do that. That's, um, you know, what do you mean? That's going to replace me and sort of that mixture of kind of ego and fear all at once that seems to come out. Um, so I think that um, I just wanted to make the comment that we need to um, expand upon, I think, or get the message out that generative AI is a tool and it will allow us to flip our time because my experience of being a practical lawyer was that there was so much pressure in getting through the tasks, in churning through tasks that you often missed that opportunity to stop and think and really consider what it was that you were doing. And generative AI is the perfect accelerator to help you churn through that tasks and give you that thinking time. It might not necessarily mean that where you you have to actually get through something quicker per se, but you actually have time to properly consider. And the re and this is affirmed by a recent study that was conducted. Um, I'll, I'll share it later, but. Basically, it found that law students, high performing law students using generative AI, their performance declined, whereas low performing law students, their performance was elevated. And one of the things was that perhaps they didn't, the high performing students, A, didn't understand how to properly integrate the technology into their work. Um, and then they also kind of abdicated to the um, AI and didn't apply their own high level nuanced critical thinking um, to what they were doing. And I think that's a message that really needs to come out is that it's an opportunity to spend more time in that area where humans do make that valuable contribution. And that is in the gray, in the nuance, in the critical thinking. Um, and that it's not something where we just stop, but it's also not something to be afraid of. So I guess that was all I wanted to say. You're here. Thank you very much. It's great to hear your voice, by the way. And uh, I've got a hat for that. Thank you. Um, we should all be like super impressed. It's currently 3.42 a.m. where I am in Bali at the moment. So... <laughs> Um, and you, you'll, you'll be next. Let me make just one quick comment on that, which is you'll you'll note that this task force is on is focused on kind of risks and harms and, you know, um, and so forth. And it's that's a critical thing for attorneys to and for everybody um, to be aware of um, the emphasis at law.mit.edu um, with respect to generative AI is really on the beneficial use of this technology um, and how um, powerful it can be, profoundly powerful to help attorneys practice at the top of our licenses, to help supercharge the better performing law students and attorneys, judges, paralegals, everybody, and to bring up the floor of performance for everybody. Um, and we think there's opportunities to do that. It gets back to one of the um, contributions earlier about the duty of competence, um, or that was my interpretation. Is there a possibility of ineffective assistance of counsel or malpractice um, when people aren't using this well. And, um, you know, that's sort of like the sharp end of the sword. I think the, I think the, the, um, the carrot um, is, is what we can get out of learning about this technology and how to use it well. Um, and, it, and it really is about thinking about the prompt and thinking very critically, as you suggested, Liz, about the outputs, what it means. Is it right? Is it wrong? Does it support our clients' priorities and interests? And how can it does it open new channels for a theory of the case and all that great stuff? Um, okay, so uh, who was it that just was about to speak when I made that comment? Um, I can't see your face anymore. Uh, where did you go? There you are. Um, okay, yes, uh, you've got your hand up and you have the floor. 
And could you say your name? I'm not sure how to pronounce it. I'm sorry. I'm not sure who you're speaking to, but usually when someone yeah. says say your name, I found yeah. that it's usually me. Hi everyone. Um, I my name is EJ. I'm really thrilled to to be here. I really I, I love this discussion. And you know, first to the task force, I really appreciate what you are doing. I think this is really important work. Um, I just had three quick points to make. Um, I was wondering how much, and I, I'd really love people's thoughts on this. I know like a lot of the challenges that we recognize when people are, you know, when we're trying to encourage attorneys to adopt the use of AI responsibly, you know, the first thing people talk about is, you know, it's competence, they're, you know, they're scared. And of course, there's a lot of truth to that, you know, they're not comfortable with tech. And I'm wondering, how, I sometimes wonder how much of it is also a function of the fact that to some extent, it's not necessarily in their interest uh, and again, I'm thinking back, I, I, I was a product manager when, um, you know, TAR was coming up. And I recognized that at the time then, even people who understood the benefit of this, uh, you know, this use of technology for like discovery, um, recognized that, well, you know, even though you're not replacing lawyers, you, you're still not going to need as many lawyers, right? And, um, you know, and to the extent that you have a business model that's dependent on, you know, billable hours, um, how much how much of some of the friction is based on things that people won't say, um, you know, and, uh, you know, just something to think about, you know, because I, 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 based on my experience with machine, you know, when, you know, with TAR, I don't necessarily believe that it's all um, about the lack of competence, you know, like attorneys are very smart people. Attorneys can learn domain uh, knowledge you know, when, if they pick up a new case and they can pick it up really quickly. So I don't know that you know, competence or comfort with technology is the complete story. I just don't know how to measure some of the other things um, that they, they don't say. Um, and the last thing I wanted to mention, and I hope this is not taken as criticism because I really love this forum. I'd love to be part of this conversation again. Um, uh, it's something that may not be as important to everyone in the room, but it's definitely important to me. So I hope you will indulge me. Um, this is important work. And when people talk about some of the, um, you know, there's a lot of there are a lot of forums that talk about some of the nefarious um, impacts of AI, and of course, people like me, uh, for whom there's not as much data training these models, we have it, it impacts us differently. And just optically, um, you know, walking into the room and being the only black person in here, I'm not criticizing. Okay, I'm just worried that perhaps your effort may be undermined by some who come in and just assume that because they're not interested in the issues that affect me. So just something to think about. And especially you all being at MIT, there's a lady named Joy Boa. Well, yeah, she's, uh, yeah, she is actually in our lab with uh, Robert right. Mahari and I. Um, okay, thanks the, for making The Algorithmic me. Justice League, among Thank other you. accolades. She, she's <laughs> and so, owed. you know, that's one person that, you know, I, I, I love to be part of the conversation, but I haven't been re researching this issue as, well, as much as she and perhaps others have been. And so it would be, uh, not only lovely to, I mean, I'm not doubting that perhaps you're also getting those perspectives. I just worry that there might be people who might just uh, discount the value of your work by just coming in and just optically. So just something to think about. Love what you're doing. And um, thanks for thanks for um, letting me join this conversation. Thank you. On that last point, um, well, all your points were welcome. Uh, on that last one, I, I think you're right. Um, I don't think we're getting a full um, spectrum of views. And I think we need help. Um, we've done what we, what I, the best I know how to do, which is insufficient, which is to make it public, to put it in the press, to anyone, I did it, anyone that contributed um, got invited to this, um, but I think we need help, and I think there's a gap, and I would ask for help. I think Joy might be a good person to start with. Um, I mean, I'm happy to help, but I really do think you already have access to somebody that who might be, um, who might add more value than Yep. I, I know. And since she got famous, she doesn't return my emails. Doesn't return, you know, but, uh, I'll do my best with her. Uh, but I, but any, this is an open call uh, and an invitation um, for, for assistance. Um, and thank you for saying that. Um, well, I see that we're two minutes um, from our promised closing time. And um, speaking of learning hard lessons, uh, I've learned not to let these things drag on beyond when I promised it would end, especially in the middle of a work day. And so uh, we're going to start to close up now. Um, thank you, everybody, for, for joining us and for contributing. Um, and uh, and for those of you that weren't comfortable contributing in this format, um, I do. if you have um, further questions or comments or ideas, um, please do um, take another swipe at the feedback form or hit reply all to the um, email invitation. And um, 
And the last thing I'll say is um, I'm coming to Europe. Uh, the Legal Hackers International Summit is in Madrid um, the first week or so of uh, September. And uh, I'm planning to maybe go to Italy and possibly one other place. So to, for those of you that are in Europe, we'd love a European perspective. And um, let, let me know um, if there's people at your firm or in your community somewhere that's easy to get to um, in from Madrid. And uh, maybe we'll, uh, we'll bring the show to your town and, uh, and do a field hearing or hear more from you. Um, and so with that, thank you again, everybody, for your generous contributions and your time. And we'll do our part uh, to, to absorb what you've said and try to reflect and support it in the next version of the report. So with that, thank you again, and go forth and enjoy the rest of this beautiful summer day. Thank you. Thank you.